Welcome to class number six, discipleship class number six. So what I'm going to do is, you've practiced soul winning many times. Now, I know the tendency of the flesh, so I expected that within discipleship class. It is possible that sometimes people can fall behind in their soul winning practice. The reason why is I'm not there to keep tabs on people online all the time. And then people in my church, sometimes they're just busy with a lot of things. And then doing this practice firsthand is probably the most uh, annoying and hard thing. But I promise you this, is that once you pass this level, your spiritual level will increase tenfold. That's why we started with soul winning. I believe it's that urgent and important. So don't feel bad about that. What, what I want you to do is this. What I want you to do is that... Um, from now on, I want you to always audio record yourself in soul winning. And you got to think about this, is that it doesn't take more than 15 minutes. It doesn't take more than 15 minutes. And I encourage you to do it three times a week if you haven't even started yet. And then once you do this, you got to realize this. After two weeks, you're done. It's that simple. I mean, after two weeks, you'll get it all in your head. Right now, you got to realize that it's been more than, uh, let's see, class number six, right? It's been more than five weeks. So you, you would have already passed the hard parts if you were consistent. That's why I kept urging you to be consistent with your homework. So what I encourage you to do is to do it three times a week, 15 minutes, even when I don't give that as a homework assignment. So even if you've fallen behind, Here's the thing, don't feel bad once we reach class number 10. Just keep writing the notes as best as you can, learn as much as you can, and as for the soul winning thing, just make sure that you just practice it in your own spare time. That's it. Now, I just want to make an apology. I don't check out people online, their audio recordings. So I apologize for that because I don't have time. So it's only for people in my church. So I really encourage you people online to try to keep up the good work. So now we're going to cover the advanced parts in soul winning. So what I want you to do, that way it can be easy for you, is as we go through each step-by-step -step process in soul winning, I want you to predict what I'm going to write, okay? That way you can keep it uh, refreshed and remember every single step in soul winning. So as I go through all the steps in soul winning, I want you to predict before I write it down. I want you to predict in your head, okay, so he's going to mention this part in the intro. Hi, my name is Gene Kim. We're not Mormons, Jehovah Witness. I want you to do that while I'm writing it out, okay? All right, so let's go through every step in soul winning and the bumps you're going to come across, okay? The bumps you're going to come across. Now, I urged everybody that this is not going to happen, so I don't want you to get scared. If you didn't practice soul winning, I want to mention this part, so I'm going to write this part down. <clears throat> if you did not practice soul winning, then when you watch this video, this is a big warning, you're going to get scared. You're going to think that soul winning is hard. Do you know why? Because in this teaching, I'm going to tell you the objections you're going to come across as you go through every step in soul winning. And you're going to be thinking, oh, I have to memorize all these parts while you didn't memorize the first part yet. And when you do that, then practicing is going to be even harder. So I want you to think this. When we go through this, if you did not practice yet, I want you, you can write out all the notes and the important stuff, but don't let these things go in your mind when you're practicing soul winning. It will discourage you from practicing. It is so easy to do soul winning. I taught you that before. So I just only want you to think about that. The reason why is this. You'd be surprised as you do soul winning with many people, you're not going to come across these bumps. Very rarely you're going to come across. Now, you might come across once in a while, but if you knock on so many doors and talk to so many people, you're going to bump one out of s somewhere of people where it's going to be easy just to do the soul winning that you've usually practiced in the previous discipleship classes. You'd be surprised how many people would just listen and will get saved. So objections won't come out often. Okay, let's do this. So intro. So remember how you do this, how you catch the fish first, 
in street preaching or tracking and visitation in these two methods is when somebody walks past by you then you know you pass out these chick tracks and then you say oh hi here's a free comic book oh hi here's a free comic book and depending on the person that you feel or is slowing down and you feel like you can catch that person when the person receives that chick track then you can say oh by the way I just want to ask you a quick question if you were to die tonight and then boom then you go through everything non-stop what you previously learned in soul winning so that's the first pointer for street preaching tracking as for a visitation you knock on somebody's door somebody answers the door and you go oh hi so as not to scare you we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witness that's a very important liner we're just going around the neighborhood giving free tracks to everybody so I'd like to give this to you so here's the objection bump you want to come across is people get scared of you so what you got to do is that people have a tendency because this is the stereotype that Satan has brainwashed our world into they have the stereotype that a person that has to do with anything with religion talking about religion is a very negative fanatic that's what people always get the impression first time so you this is a first objection <clears throat> people get scared of you and we're talking about the intro so in order to avoid this part of people getting scared of you what you've got to do is in door knocking what is the first thing on your mind when someone knocks on on your door Jehovah Witness or moment or Mormon that's the very first thing so you have to stress this part we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses make sure that you stress this clearly and that's like the very first thing if not the first thing then one of the first things that come out of your mouth quickly okay so that's how that's objection number one is this hurdle so make sure you stress this part if you're doing street preaching and passing out uh, free comics here's good advice if you're street preaching obviously you can't do two things at one time right <clears throat> you can't do street preaching while you're passing out chick tracks now people in our church we can do that a lot of times and get away with it but sometimes that doesn't work so while you're street preaching here's good advice stop preaching oh pastor are you telling me that street preaching doesn't work no street preaching does work but street preaching is to the people who aren't going to receive your track or stop to listen to you sometimes it does but a lot of times it doesn't street preaching is for the people that you know can hear the gospel when they're walking by or with traffic lights and cars or in a big festival or whatnot or a person who walks by you only have a few sentences that you can catch them in if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one talking obviously you can't go if you are to die today are you 100 percent you can't obviously you can't do that in soul winning so stop preaching and focus on passing out chick tracks because the person is going to normally think because if there's a person passing out free comic going free comic free comic free comic and you pass by that person the natural reaction is you'll receive that chick track comic see that so you can do that so make sure you stop preaching when you're doing outdoor evangelism street preaching and take like a couple minutes passing out chick tracks that's what I did what I did was when I was street preaching at college campuses and I this is liberal San Francisco we're Bay Area we're talking about here I street preached at college campuses and what I did after I was done street preaching at college campuses is I took some time off for like about 10 minute pauses or 20 minute pauses in between and focused on passing out chick tracks and believe it or not in liberal college campuses within um, within a season within a season time limit I led more I led about 10 souls to salvation that's really good for a liberal college campus 10 souls within less than a season see so make sure you produce that attitude when I'm in street preaching see I'm focusing on like hundreds of people who get a chance to hear it even if they walk away or far away because they can hear my voice and hear the gospel 
But to catch fish personally, it's focusing on the chick tracks. And then for visitation, door knocking, make sure you stress this part. Here's another thing. Okay, now we come to, we continue. Hi, we're not Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. We're just going around the neighborhood passing out free comics. And uh, here's one for you so that we're not strangers. My name's Gene. What's your name? Blah, blah, blah. And then use some friendly conversation to make uh, the person less tense. So people get scared of you, right? So not only stress this line or stop preaching, but sometimes normal conversation, right? So use some conversation that a person will normally enjoy talking to you about. That way you can ease the mood. You can use this one too. But this is optional. This is optional. This is optional. So here are three things that you can use. After using some normal conversation, now recall your soul winning method. We're going through every step as you notice. You do some normal conversation and then you go, oh, by the way, just want to ask you a quick question. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And then the person, that's the point, the question, right? If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? This is probably where you're going to get the most objection out of people. Out of everything in soul winning, this is probably the more common hurdle. People obviously are not going to answer your question correctly. If you're to die today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You're waiting for them to say no or I don't know where I'm going to go, right? And then boom, you resume your normal soul winning. That's what you previously learned. But a person, not everyone's going to say, no, I don't know. So what if they say yes, right? Yes, I know. Then what you need to do next is you got to ask them this sub question. Oh, okay, that's good. That's nice. See, make it innocent. Don't condemn them. You say, oh, okay, that's great. And then you go like this. Okay, that's good. Do you know how? See, that's the thing you want to ask them this. Do you know how to go to heaven? And then when you ask them that question, okay, that's good. Do you know how to go to heaven? Because the Bible says there's only one right way to heaven. And do you know what that right way is to heaven? See, you now you clutch them. You corner them at that specific question. When you make a question that specific, you, you are going to be, uh, they are forced to give a specific answer. And when they give that specific answer of how they got saved, then you know they're not saved or they are saved. And when you do this, do you know how to go to heaven? Commonly, people will give a wrong answer. And when they do that, then what you do next is this. They're going to give a wrong answer. And once they do this, then you go to the next part, which is, well, you know, you compliment them, okay? That way they don't feel that bad. You can compliment them. You go like, well, that's a pretty good answer. Or I used to think that's the right answer. Or 90% of the people actually think that's the right answer like you do. So say stuff like that. Say something where you don't say, you're wrong, like that. You want to basically compliment them. Now, obviously, don't do it excessively as a compliment where you're saying something doctrinally wrong. That's the right answer. Good job. You know, that's a smart answer. No, <laughs> obviously, you don't want to say that way. You want to basically say, a complimenting answer. You can use stuff like, this is what I commonly use. I say, well, actually, 90% of the people give the same answer like you do. But you know the Bible says, boom. So after you give them a compliment, then you go, but the Bible says,
and then you show them the verse where their answer is wrong. That's the key. You show them the verse where their answer is wrong. Now, this is what I predict from people when they give a wrong answer. Mostly, it's going to have to do anything that has to do with good works for salvation. Some, pers some people might answer this way. Oh, yeah, uh, I, I know that I can go to heaven because uh, I kept all the commandments of God and I went to church, been a very good person. And uh, when they give that kind of answer, you know that's good works. So here's something very important, is that when they give this wrong answer, pay attention and see if they mean good works. Obviously, the person is not going to say, oh yeah, uh, I do good works for salvation. They're not going to give like a plain answer like that, and then you can catch them and show them what's wrong. They're going to give some kind of abstract answer. But here's the thing. If you're smart enough you can catch whatever answer they're saying relates to good works. And you don't really have to be smart to be honest. You can tell. Any answer they'll give that has to do with going to heaven, you'll be surprised. It'll relate to good works nearly 100% of the time. So listen to what they say. Let me give another example right here. Oh yeah, uh, I believe I was saved by faith. I believe I'm saved by faith and I got baptized. Now, you notice how much more tricky I worded that, right? Because I said saved by faith, you would think, oh, this person is a saved Christian. No, he mentioned baptism there. So catch, be nitpicky. Some of you onlineers are very good at being nitpicky and critic, critic, criticizing stuff. So why don't you use that as your advantage now? Sometimes people use the nitpickiness for the wrong things when they should be using it for the right things. So the thing is this, <clears throat> pay attention, be nitpicky on how they answer it, and then catch anything that relates to good works. Let me give you another one right here. Oh well, yeah, I'm a saved Christian. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I mean, I repented all my sins. I quit smoking. I quit drinking. So because I stopped those sins, I know for a fact I'm going to heaven. That sounded like a e typical evangelical Christian you would hear today. But if you used your nitpicky mindset, did you catch anything where I said good works here? You did, didn't you? I thought that if I stopped these sins, that I would be going to heaven. So you caught me right there. So make sure that you pay attention. And then you give them some kind of compliment. And then you go, but the Bible says, and then you show them the verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So show them Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And then, if you recall, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is one of your methods in soul winning, right? One of the steps in soul winning. So, after you finish Romans 5, 9, and the next one is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, skip Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Because you already mentioned that at the beginning. Okay? So skip this part when you come to your regular soul winning. What do I do after that, Pastor? I show them Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Do the way you are trained in soul winning. Simply tell them that good works cannot save them. Tell them that their answer, whatever wrong answer they gave, explain to them that their wrong answer, how Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 explains that part is wrong. So let's say a person said that I got baptized so I know that I'm saved. Then after I quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I would go, well, you know, work anything that you do, see? It says, not of works lest any man should boast. Not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Anything you do can't save you. You got to understand. So, after you answer that, you noticed how short that was too. That was like uh, within one minute, right? And then, boom, you go to Romans 3.23, Revelation 21, 8 through 9, blah, 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 blah. You just keep talking non-stop. So after you show them Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and explain to them what's wrong with their answer, then keep talking non-stop. Boom, 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 boom. You already open the door. You already know that they don't 
know how to go to heaven after they die. And then you just keep talking, ba 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 like that. Now, here's, I put a little space in here because there could be another subpoint after this one, all right? The other subpoint underneath this one is this. They might give a right answer. Okay, that's good. Do you know how to go to heaven? Then you might hear somebody saying something like this. Oh, yeah, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. What are you going to do? The tendency is to say, oh, you're a saved Christian. No, you got to realize this, is that I think a lot of my onliners don't need to know this part. But for some of you beginners who don't know, you got to understand this. You know that it's so deceptive out there in churches. And a lot of them, they might say the right words of the gospel, but in reality, they're giving a false gospel. So what does that mean? I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. What does that mean? Taking communion at the Eucharist? That's how Catholics think. That's why Catholics can get along with Billy Graham. See? Uh, another thing right there, they might say that, they might think I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, meaning that Lordship salvation garbage, that because I quit and stopped doing all these sins, I'm going to heaven. So when they give an answer that's abstract, now look, if they give an answer that you know is the right answer, then accept it, okay? Don't be overtly critical and say, oh, wh uh, what did you mean by that? And interrogate them. Don't interrogate them. When you're soul winning, you're not interrogating them. That's an important thing. So I want to add that as a tip. So let me put here tips. So here's one of the tips when you're doing soul winning. Never interrogate. Don't give that kind of attitude. If you interrogate them, you know, then they're going to get very bothered. And you might be talking to a genuinely saved Christian. And if you interrogate them, they're going to have a bad, a bad opinion of you, of a Bible believer. And Bible believers should never give that kind of testimony. So what I'm driving at here is that if they give an answer that is clear enough, clear enough, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be like exact perfect wording, but it's clear enough and you get it, then just take it for granted they're saved. If they're not, if they give an abstract answer, then what you do is this, is that, what you need to do, okay, that's great. This is the big part, testimony. You get them in testimony. That's how you know a person is not saved. What you do is, okay, that's great, and then you ask them for their testimony. How did you get saved? then you get them. By the way, here's a very big tip. If you're not sure that the answer that they're giving is a clear enough answer that makes you believe they're a safe Christian, you might be wondering in your head, man, I don't know, are they still a safe Christian? Guess what? If you go to this part and say, okay, that's great. How did you get saved? Um, when did this happen? When you ask them for their testimony, they don't think it's interrogation. They think that you're happy that they're saved and they just like to know how you got saved. When you ask them for their testimony of, okay, that's great, how did you get saved? They don't mind answering that. And that's how you can catch them. So they might say something like, well, you know, I was in a church service and I saw Jesus and because I saw Jesus, I know at that moment I was speaking in tongues and I personally accepted Jesus as my Savior after that. Then you know in your head that, oh, this person's definitely not saved. See? And then when you get that answer, then you explain to them what's wrong about it. And then after you explain to them what's wrong about it, then just remember, go keep not non-stopping, keep talking. Romans 3.23, Revelation 21.8. Just keep talking. See? Just keep talking. So that's what you want to do. What you want to do is you want to get them to ask their testimony. And then you'll catch them after that. Now, remember this. So let's review over here. So we're back to this question, right? If you're to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? They'll go, oh, yeah, I, I know that I'm going to heaven. Next part. Okay, that's good. 
do you know how to go to heaven? And then most of the time they're going to give a wrong answer, so keep your ears open. And anything that relates to good works, then you jump to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, after Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, then you go back to regular soul winning and just keep talking, blah, 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 like that. Now, here's another thing, though. Let's say that when you say, okay, that's good, do you know how to go to heaven? And they give a somewhat right answer or an almost right answer, you're just not sure. Oh, yeah, I personally accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Then the tendency is like, oh, that person saved. No, that's pretty abstract. Or it's, it may be a right answer. They are really saved when they say that. So then the, if you want to just double check and make sure, it doesn't hurt to use this line. It never hurts to use this line. They don't feel they're being interrogated. Okay, that's great. How did you get saved? Can you tell me how it happened? They would be happy to tell you. And then they're going to tell you what they meant by that. And then you pay attention, and depending how they give the answer, it, remember, you know how to get saved. With the repentant heart, you tell God that I only trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If they don't give that kind of an answer, an answer that relates to that, then you know clearly they're not saved. So whatever answer they give from their testimony, then you're going to have to show them that somehow from the Bible, it does, that's not salvation. That's not salvation. And then after you answer their question, that's not salvation, then boom, you go to Romans 3.23, Revelation 21.8, blah, 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 nonstop, nonstop. Okay, now we're at Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then you ask them this, uh, do you know what sin is? They'll go, uh, no, I don't know what sin is, and you have to explain to them what sin is, right? Or if they say, uh, yeah, I know what sin is, then you can jump to the next part. Okay, now remember, I'm, I'm saying all this stuff, taking for granted you know everything in basic soul winning. Okay, I already went through that several times, so I'm not going to go through all this stuff, all right? This is taking for granted you know all of regular soul winning. Okay, so remember, the next step is after you ask them what sin is and they know what sin is, then you come to the next part. Okay, so have you sinned before? So here's now hurdle number three now. Hurdle number three, now this is very rare. I never heard anyone say this, but you'd be surprised some people do. They'll go, no, I have not sinned before. <laughs> that is extremely rare, I, but trust me, it does happen. I believe Brother Daniel bumped across one in his soul winning before with Sean, if I recall. Yeah, so, really? yeah, there was, yeah, believe it or not, yeah. And I think Sean tried to corner him like, you never lusted at one time in your thought before. <laughs> the guy was crazy. I, now, for me, I never bumped anyone like that. Even liberal students in college campus that I was street preaching at, they all know they've sinned, okay? No one's dumb to say, no, I have not sinned. Okay, so if they say no, they have not sinned, then here's how you can answer. You simply answer with the text itself, Romans 3.23. You might say, really? Is that easy? Yeah, because read it again. For what? All have sin. But how is sin defined? Come short of the glory of God. So the point is this. So how you answer this is that sin is not... 100% perfect. See, when you say it like this, 100% perfect, like God, always compared to holy God. When you word these two parts, like God, 100% perfect, the person knows he slipped up somewhere. The person knows he's imperfect. Once he gets that, then he actually believes he's a sinner. So whether he believes it or not, Deep down inside his heart, he knows he's a sinner. So you can catch him like that, okay? That's hurdle number three. Then you answer like that. After you answer, ask him the question again. Ask him the question, so according to this definition, have you sinned before? Then they're going to have to honestly respond yes. But here's another thing you got to understand. This is one more thing I want to add. Another thing I want to add is that when people say no, they have not sinned, sometimes they don't know what sin is. 
when you ask them have they sinned before, they're probably thinking, oh, like murder or like something like really, really bad. And they're going to say, oh, no, I'm not a sinner. No, I have not sinned. And that's an understandable reaction. Okay? It's not like the first part, okay, where they're really dumb about it. No, this is a normal reaction. So when you come to that point, then you have to explain to them the same thing. See that? So in this second part here where they misunderstand sin, they think like it's murder, it's killing, you tell them this, is that sin is not something really bad. It's not just something really bad. It's not just like something really bad. It's like, boom, you go to this argument, Romans 3.23. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Sin is not 100% perfect like, the, like God. Resort to this definition every time, and then you'll have a person, even a good Muslim, even a good Muslim admitting that he is a sinner. And that's how I always corner Muslims, is that I don't debate all the stuff about the Quran. I've done that before, but very rarely. I always corner them on how imperfect they are in front of God. That's why their works cannot save them. They have to admit they need a savior, a personal savior. And that works almost all the time. Okay, next one, Revelation 21.8. Then you say, but the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the penalty of sin is a burning hell. That's what you got to understand. Now, you're not asking them questions here. You're just keeping on yakking, right? So you'd be, and you're also keeping this short too, right? If you don't want to go to hurdle number four, you're going to come across hurdle number four here because people don't like hell, okay? It's a very negative reaction. But if you don't want hurdle number four, as long as you keep it short, they understand the penalty of sin is a burning hell, you'd be surprised you won't even do hurdle number four. But sometimes you'll have hurdle number four. Maybe the person you're talking to is a Jehovah Witness. And they might say, wait, hell? Burning hellfire? No, uh... Hell's not burning forever. It's like the grave or something. See that? So then, what you need to do is with hurdle number four, you're going to come across these kind of reactions. In hurdle number four, you're going to come across the reactions where people, they think it's cruel. That's the first normal reaction concerning hell. They think it's cruel, and God would not uh, send a person to burn in hell for all eternity. So how would you answer that part? How you can answer this part is that when people say that it's cruel, your answer is going to be in this way. Your answer is going to be that it's totally understandable. So explain to them it's totally understandable. Understand their point of view. People will listen to you when you go to their level, their point of view. So explain to them that you understand, and you would even think it's cruel. But then how you catch them is this. How you catch them is that God, remember Romans 3.23? God has a high standard concerning sin, right? So you got to realize this. What God is thinking here is his holiness at stake. Remember, he's not just holy or just perfect. He's 100%, right? That's the key right here. If he's 100% holy, he cannot tolerate even 1% of sin. That's how you get them to understand. How you get them to understand this condemnation of hell is to not go, not go into the level of sympathy where God you know, understands he'll let things slide. Because you've got to make them understand this. If you focus so much on perfection and holiness they are enforced to go to this point of view now. That, okay, I can see why there is a hell. Because why? God is 100% holy. If he tolerates and sl slides, slips 1% of sin, well, it's okay, you can come to heaven after that. No, he cannot allow that. Period, no, no, no. Here's another thing. If he's 100% holy, isn't he going to be mad even the smallest kind of sin? 
See, that's what you want to emphasize on, is that if he's 100% holy, it shows how much he hates 1% of sin. That's why he doesn't hesitate to damn somebody to hell for all eternity. Can you and I do that? Obviously not. I don't even think Adolf Hitler can do that. You know why? Because we're human who have sinned. Human nature, we can understand human feelings, human tendencies. But you see, God, if he stoops himself to that level, then what? He misses out 100% holiness. So that's why it's important that in this part right here, when you stress about the part where if God is so perfect, so high in standard and holiness, he would hate even the smallest kind of sin. When you focus on that, see, God is different from humans. Because why? He's 100% holy. We never can attain that. That's why we couldn't do that with people burning in hell. But God, he doesn't hesitate to do that with a person burning in hell. If you focus on that, then you catch them. Okay? That's how you catch them. Okay. And not only that, so here's how you can answer one. Now, answer two, some people may deny a burning hell fire, right? So then just focus on Revelation 21a. See that? Focus where it says, literally, I mean, it listed the sinners and it listed fire, right? It listed all these sinners going to fire. So if it does that, that means hell is not just some party or the grave. It is a literal place where you burn because of the sins you committed. That's how you catch them. Okay, so I was actually surprised. So this might uh, take a little while. I thought it'd be really quick, but I just... I'm going through every hurdle that I can think of in soul winning. So that's what I'm doing. So what we'll do is that in our next class, we will, we will go through the next hurdle parts. And then I also want you to, uh, when you're practicing your soul winning, now if you've fallen behind in soul winning, I don't want you to do this. If you do this, you're going to get pressured and you're going to fall more behind in soul winning. Okay? Finish the first step, please. I think some of you are scared already now looking at all this. That's why I don't do that. Okay? You'd be surprised. Let me emphasize this again. You'd be surprised how many people don't go through these hurdles when you're soul winning. Okay? So let me stress this again. If you have not passed that practice part yet, do that, please. As for the rest of you who practice, okay, include this in your practice now. Okay? So when you're practicing your soul winning, anticipate these kind of hurdles and practice how you can answer them. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dismiss discipleship class with your blessing and bless the next service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe 
only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried, and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.